What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another THI podcast brought to you by TarHillIllustrated.com. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner. Joining me, as he always does, is our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And AJ, we we had a, uh, I mean, I guess fun is probably the right word to say as we, this oh, morning, yeah. as we got to go out to Keenan Stadium and, and watch some football practice for the first time this spring. And first time in a while, I know, I know everything kind of interconnects with football and basketball season. But for some reason today, it did feel like it's been a while since we've got to go out there and, and watch the football team, even though in reality it hasn't been that long when it really comes down to I it. I was so. out there two weeks ago. For you, yeah, for you. For, yeah. For over, at the, over at the practice facility, but today was a lot different. And, and the rest, we had five THI staffers there. Yeah, well yeah, represented five. today. Yeah, well yeah represented. Brandon was there, Dina, you, Kevin, and me. So yeah. two of you were on the field shooting and – I was up at the stands, which is good. I, I like the pra- open practice the stands. I really enjoyed sitting up there and different having point. a different view than being in the field and practice. So, yeah, you say fun. Absolutely, it's fun. Yeah, I think fun's I a, a, a football good practice, word baseball practice, hockey practice. When I covered the hurricane, some uh, any every practice in all sports is fantastic because you learn so much, and it's great for junkies like me. Yeah, and it's it's more laid back than a game. Games when you're covering it, for instance, a game's like all action. It's awesome, but practice is like this, a little more laid back. You get to kind of sit there, soak it all in a little bit more, and and kind of figure out what you're going to say after it. So that's what we're here to do. We're here to talk about some insights, observations from from Carolina's open practice this morning, 10 a.m. in Keenan Stadium. Um, a couple hundred fans there as well. I know the weather wasn't great, but a, a decent turnout for for an open practice on March 25th. Um, so the weather sucked. Yeah, it was it hard, rained man. all morning until about ten forty-five, and everybody yep. was. I, I was up there over under the overhang of the upper mm-hmm. deck, and I was surprised that people were even there. Yeah, me too. The diehards, yeah, though, it, it was pouring. There, yeah. there were some guys tailgating. There were some guys tailgating. Like really, you're tailgating for this? Wow, that's I didn't see that stuff right there. That's good. That's good. It's a big day in Chapel Hill too, because you got the baseball game, lacrosse game, I believe, this afternoon as well. So yeah, yeah. I guess they would maybe they were hitting all three, getting pre-gamed up, which more power three, to them. Yeah. Get you tailgating on March 25th doesn't happen very often, so you might as well enjoy it if you can. Um, Absolutely. Let, let's talk insights. Let's talk observations. We'll we'll start with the offensive side of the ball in terms of guys who stood out, and then we'll talk defense, and then maybe towards the end we can talk coaching a little bit as well, because I know that's a big thing with so many new faces down there. So. We'll start on the offensive side of the ball. I'll, I'll ask you your kind of observations and I'll kind of go after that. So anybody that stood out, anything that stood out on the offensive side of the ball? You know, my approach at the first practice every year was just to get all kinds of notes, get a vibe and see what just automatically catches my eye. And mm-hmm. then when I go in for the second opportunity to watch practice, I, I'm more specific in what I'm looking at. So, I guess I can name some stuff that caught my eye today, but but my my purpose today, and it's easier when a bunch of you guys go as well. So yeah. more we have a lot more eyeballs. When it's just me at practice and I've got to do pretty much everything, uh, it's a little more difficult. So today I decided I was going to watch specific players because I wanted to see either some of the new guys or some of the returning players. I just wanted to get a good feel for them. For example, the returning guys, I've been hearing a lot of, tremendous stuff about Spencer Rowland. Mm-hmm. He's moved to right tackle. So I watched him a lot today and I was talking to somebody in the program a couple of weeks ago and they said, look, you know, this guy's now got an off season at a power five. They didn't have the off season programs at Harvard. They had a program, but not like what you're going to find at any ACC. And he's already got the leverage. He's already got some of the athletic ability that we've seen before. But what I saw today was a little bit more filled out guy and someone who really looked the part of a very good power five offensive tackle. Mm-hmm. And I've been told by somebody, by somebody in the program that they think he might be, you know, a, a, maybe the best NFL prospect on the offensive line of the guys playing right now. So I wanted to watch him and I wanted to watch him from the stands from a different vantage point, you know, where I was sitting right at the 50 yard line, just above a little bit toward the tunnel is where the press box is. So it wasn't quite the press box angle, but it was fairly close and enough to kind of give me a a visual. Okay. Let's take our memory bank and place it next to what I see right now and see if there are any differences. And there were definitely some differences. 
There's no doubt about it. So I'm looking forward to seeing him again when we have another availability to watch practice, which I think will be the last one will be the 15th. I'm hoping, and if Jeremy's watching this, I'm putting in a, a, wink, a, wink. a bug in his ear. I'm hoping we can get another one yeah. so I could watch more. Of yeah, I would love another I mean, one. I go, I go every on. day if they open it every day for us. Yeah, bring but, it on. Bring it on. But but I really like, I really, I look for Roland. I really like Roland. I, I'll throw a few other names out and we yeah, can go we back to you. We can end some of those names. But I specifically watched Amari Gaynor for a while. Mm-hmm. And I have some interesting things I want to bring up about him later on. I specifically watched Elijah Huzzy. I specifically watched Willie Lampkin, the, the offensive guard, the guard transfer from Coastal Carolina. Um, it's impossible. I guess you want to talk guys that pop, that just stand out. Tez Walker stands out. Yeah, he's, he he's my number one right now. first time I went to practice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, he's he, he and McCollum are going to lead. They're going to be the two leading receivers, I think. I think Pace so or, they're in really good shape at receiver. Those guys stood out. I'll tell you also, the tight ends are just so yeah. good. Mm-hmm. They're, it's impossible to miss those guys. I didn't watch the quarterbacks a ton because I know I'm going to get another chance to watch them. And I, I thought, you know, I would rather get more of an opinion on Connor Harrell and Tad Hudson at the end of spring yeah. than early stages of spring, because especially Tad. He need, we need to see what he looks like after going through this for a month or so. So I didn't really want to pay too much attention to him, but there were a lot of things I watched and we can get into it was about some of the other guys as well. But the other thing I will say, Ryan Coe has got a leg. Mm-hmm. I think that they're, they have an upgraded kicker. There's no doubt about it. He's got a leg and I'll tell you what, on kickoffs, if the first 10 get beat and he's your safety valve, he's going to hit somebody. Yeah, man, That's a big dude. He's not a bad looks like a freaking linebacker out there. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it. So, so what? So, what are yours? What are some of the ones that step? Yeah, and we'll, yeah. we'll go will, back to some of those guys. If you want me to elaborate yeah. on some of those guys, I will later. We will, we will, because I'll, I'll name a couple guys. And I primarily did defensive videos, but the good thing about today was that they 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 kind of went through a what I'm not I don't know if scrimmage is the right word, but eleven v eleven kind of they got a little more contact towards the end, but they yeah. did that for almost half the practice. So it was good because I was able to kind of watch both the sides at that point. But definitely Tez Walker. Number I, I said it earlier, but he was probably the number one guy that stood out to me offensively today because it, it's hard for me to kind of put my finger on exactly what it is about him because this is the first time I'm seeing him. But I think the first time I saw him was when they were doing a little bit of kind of a mock eleven on eleven scrimmage, and he took a just a just a deep ball um, down the side one v one with one of the corner and just beat him to it and just made a play on it. And that was nice. kind of the first or second time. And, and it, it was funny AJ because at this point I was I was focusing on the defensive so much that I. I hadn't really got over the offense yet. So in my head, I'm like, who is that? And I was like, oh, it's Tez Walker. And I know because we had talked, he was a guy that stood out to you at the first practice. So when that clicked, I was like, okay. And then for the majority of the rest of practice, I really try to follow him. And just a guy that looks the part, just a guy that makes plays and a guy that I know it's early, but seems to have a little bit of that it factor about him. He looks like a guy that just is better than some of the rest out there just by the way he operates and the way he plays. So I think that's a big time kind of compliment I can give him for the first time. He's hard to miss. So give me your little thoughts. I was Brandon came, Brandon was sitting next to me for most of the practice as well. And we were watching him too, because again, he did, he did to us what, what, what you saw. Yeah. But we weren't specifically looking for him, but then there's Tess. Yeah. That's exactly what happened to me. He's in your picture because he's in your picture. Mm -hmm. And, and this is not, this is not a criticism of Carolina or ACC or anything like that. I think the point here that Brandon made was he goes, man, he's like an SEC guy. Yeah. Meaning yeah. that it, he looks like someone you would, and it wasn't, yeah, he's a Mississippi state guy. It's more, he looks like someone you'd see at Bama or Georgia. Yeah. He's a, or when really LSU's play. great. He's, mm-hmm. I, I just think he's going to be really, really good. He's going to rack up some numbers. And I think he and McCollum complement each other really, really well. McCollum yeah. had a beautiful touchdown pass and kind of playing a little bit of that role that Josh Downs did, but I'll Carolyn's going to be fine at receiver, Jacob. Oh yeah. That was good. I don't I was think there are any issues. Nothing to worry about. They're deep. You lost all Antoine green. You, you lost Josh Downs, but I think they're going to be just fine at receiver. Yeah. No issues. That was a big takeaway for me as well was, was that because I, I do think they're deep and there's a couple guys, JJ Jones, I have a practicing right now. There's a couple yeah. guys that are, you know, you got your fifth or sixth guy out there and you're like, oh, wow, like 
any other year, he'd probably be a starter potentially. But you, there's just you know what's funny is Paul Billups, the true freshman, is wearing mm-hmm. number eleven. So if I, Brandon I took like, a couple well, pictures of him. I was like, what receiver would want to wear on. number eleven coming after Josh Downs? And I said, yeah, well, Paul Billups has got some game. Yeah, he does. And the staff just loves his potential. And yeah. And don't be surprised if a guy, you know, Christian Hamilton's out there, and we mm-hmm. we saw him at the Showtime a couple times, and. He's very, very talented. They've got a lot of dudes in that room. I don't think that's a room anybody should worry about. Tight end people shouldn't worry about. No. Um, quarterback, there are other aspects on offense I think people should still be a little concerned about. But receiver, tight end, quarterback, at least as long as Drake's healthy, uh, they're in outstanding shape. Yeah, the tight end room's funny because I don't know if you saw the – it was like during the first 20 minutes of the scrimmage that – um the first or second offensive drive, uh, Kamari Morales caught a couple big balls down the middle. And I, I, I had to think for us, I was like, oh, yeah, he is back on this team. Not to mention you got John Copenhaver right behind him. Oh, and I forgot about Bryson Nesbitt, too. I mean, it's just that that almost you kind of have to get back in the football mode a little bit. Yeah. And that was a getting back in the football mode moment for me when I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, they really are deep at that tight end position. Um, yeah, r- Running backs as well. I think. I don't know if you noticed this today, and I don't know if this was by design or if it was just trying to, if, if the coaching staff is trying to just create a little bit of separation in that room or trying to force to do that. A lot of running today, a lot of running the ball is one thing I noticed, and a lot of different guys getting looks during the scrimmages. George Petaway probably stood out the most at that running back room, although I think Armion Hampton and Elijah Green definitely looked the part as well and looked good at times when they were running the ball. But George Petaway, I can think of two instances in particular where there's one where he he juked back after he caught the ball and made a guy literally made a golf fall down, kind of slip and fall on his heels, and the whole sidelines kind of got up for that one. And there was another one where maybe in a real game, if the defense was really hitting, Jaquarius Conley would have got him. But where regardless, he still made Conley miss and ended up running into the end zone. And I think Mac, who was kind of not refereeing it, but kind of calling the shots there, even gave him the touchdown for it because it was kind of one of those bang bang plays since the defense wasn't going 100%. But I thought George Petterway really looked good. And he's kind of a guy we forgot about last year, AJ, because his his minutes went down and opportunities went down besides on special teams as the year went on. But to me, he looked quick, he looked elusive, and he looked really sharp. And, and honestly, I think a little bit more confident today because I was also on the sidelines and got to see him kind of operate over there as well. Just yeah. felt like he was oozing a little bit more confidence too. So I think that's a big plus. If you can get a guy like him producing, man, it's already a really deep room. That that would be a big plus for this offense. He had to learn. Yeah, man, one hundred percent. Destroying guys in high school is destroying guys in and high he, school. Getting to college is a different animal, and it's not just physically the too. speed and the physicality and how um, intricate the offenses are and extensive the playbook is. A lot of it's just learning how to be a college football player, learning how to play on a team that's got a lot of older dudes. Now with the you know the portal in the fifth year. The COVID year stuff, a lot of these true freshmen are playing with 23 year olds. So in 18, imagine your universe. You went too long ago for you, a little bit longer for me. 18 year olds and 23 year olds don't generally hang out. No, not so really. So no. it's 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 added a little bit of the uh I think it makes it a little bit more interesting what those what the locker rooms are like when you've got a little bit wider. And I think it's gonna stay that way eventually because I do believe I'm, and my understanding is incidentally will eventually add a fifth year of eligibility, which I think is a good thing. We'll have another podcast about that a different day. But mm-hmm. I think part of it for George was just getting comfortable. That was a big, big, big part of it. And he does appear a lot more comfortable. I like the way that he hit holes. But you mentioned them working a lot on the running. Uh, there is an unbelievable emphasis on not just running the ball well, but being physical running the ball well. Mm-hmm. You're doing stuff that gets somebody free to pick up big yards is all fine and dandy, but they have to have a run the ball hard and well and physically mindset at all times. And those are the plays that spring bigger runs because this, in order for this club to reach to, to match their stated mission and their stated mission is that nine wins are enough. So we're going to judge them by that. Yeah. Just like we judge basketball for about two weeks on their stated mission. And then that was gone. Yes, sure. um, we're we're going to judge football on the state of mission, which is nine wins are not good enough. And one of the avenues to get past nine wins is to be much more physical in the run game, not just in the red zone, but in general. Yeah. Because you, as a, anybody that's ever played the line of scrimmage from high school up, you know what it's like when you start losing battles on a regular basis there. You get mentally beaten down. 
you get emotionally beaten down and that's how you lose. That's why when people say, man, games are won or lost in trenches, it's absolutely that. And there hadn't been a lot of games where this offensive line has won in the trenches. They've done a good job and they sprung big plays for more points, but I'm talking get up, line up and just own the line of scrimmage. And I, I, I think part of the running, running, running today is hammering home, not just to the back, you got to be tougher, but to the guys up front, you got to be tougher. And part of that's the Randy Clemens thing. Part of that's Chip Lindsey, who comes from more of a running background than Phil did, even though he's in the same offense. And Phil appreciated the run, but a lot of his run yardage, run yardage in his offense over the years at different stops were quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. Here, you want to have a, they want to have a lot more of the run yardage come straight from the running backs, and boom, physicality winning at the line of scrimmage. So, I, I thought we saw a lot more physicality in general today yeah. than I expected, especially with fans there. They hit a lot today and they hit right out of the gate. They hit the whole time. So mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of ice baths going on right now. Yeah. I want to talk about more about physicality when we talk about the defense too, because that was a big thing that stood out for me being down on the field on, on that side of the ball in particular last thing. And we kind of can't, can't really talk about the offense and not at least mention Drake may. I think that's just kind of disrespectful to a guy as good as he is. Cause AJ, I mean, uh, again, I, I watched, I was down on the field a lot last year. I got to see him up close and personal, really make some nice plays. And then we kind of, as the whole team did, especially offensively, kind of petered off a little bit towards the end of the year and didn't look as dominant as he did early in the year. But, I mean, he's just really good, man. And he's gotten a little bit bigger. You know, just being up close and personal around there, he's he's a presence down there on the field too, not only because of how good he is, but just because of his fit size and, and kind of the aura he carries around with him when he – is down there doing what he does, but I don't know if I, I can't confirm this is the last thing I'll say about him, but I, I, there was one touchdown pass he made when they were doing some, like starting on the 20 and, and going towards the end, you know, three plays to score. Um, I don't know if he's like kind of Patrick Mahomes snake eyes, a couple guys and just kind of looked over here and threw it that way. But it, that, yeah. it looked like that's what he did. I was looking through a camera lens, but regardless, I, his head was not looking straight at the receiver and he just threaded the needle on one right up the middle and ended up, they ended up scoring on it. So again, just a guy that really continues to impress. And, and I, he's going to be fun to watch again this year, because like we've said, AJ, they've got some weapons on this offense, man. They really, really do. And I think it, it could be a really fun year for a guy like Drake may, when you look at what's around him. I think the drop off late last year was that they became a little bit more predictable because they yeah. had run through the gamut with the, with the running backs and um, without getting too deep into things, I think Phil just kind of scaled back a little bit late. They, they, there wasn't as much variety there. This, the targets and Josh Downs increased. They yeah. started throwing to him all the time. I just think that they went away from some of the things that were working. And as a result, they put Drake in a little bit of a tighter box to operate. Agreed. And uh, so we didn't see the whole whole of his game as much the last four weeks of the season. Uh, with what you were just talking about, uh, a couple of things about Drake. Phil said a couple of times when he was there that he makes – these Patrick Mahomes like plays. I think I saw it today. Yeah. I think I did. he said, you know, he reminds me of him in some mm -hmm. ways. Well, we talked to Clyde Christensen last week, who, by the way, was just coaching Tom Brady six months ago, five months ago, four months ago, and also coached Jameis Winston and also coached Peyton Manning and also coached Andrew Luck and has won multiple Super Bowls Not a bad as list. quarterbacks coach and offensive <laughs> corner and so on. He said that Drake reminds him of Andrew Luck. Because he he can be the prototypical drop back pro style guy, but can also run. Yeah, he can run. Yeah. And what we're going to see more from the offense is we're going to see it a little bit more pro style stuff. It's going to be the same basic offense in, a, in in most respects. But we learned today that there's going to be more of a full cadence, not just a clap. And they're having some struggles with the cadence. There have been a lot of early movement on offense. And during through the first six days of six practices of, of spring practice. Um, but there's Chip Lindsay told us a couple of weeks ago there are gonna be more drops with with Drake, meaning it's gonna drop back to th three, you know, they used to have the three, five, and seven uh step drops, and a lot of that was went away with the advent of spread everything and quick uh, quarterbacks always in shotgun, but they're adding some of that, some of those elements now, which is good because he says that Drake can handle all the pro style stuff and it's going to help him when he moves on to the next level, but he can also take off and run. 
and he knows when to run a lot like Andrew Luck. So he said he reminds him of that. Uh, I didn't watch the quarterbacks a ton today, because but there were some times I watched Drake and I was like, well, geez, I mean, he got better yeah. and he's getting better. So yeah. that's, and it's really unfortunate for Connor Harrell and Tad Hudson, Jefferson Boas to be the backups behind him because it, it, it's a losing proposition. And if people are going to look back and say, hey, so who's the next guy? Mm-hmm. It, it's impossible to measure up at this point. Mm-hmm. So Drake is Drake and Carolina fans should be very excited. So I thought it I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought there was a lot of spirit around some of the throws that Drake made too, because this club knows that they have somebody special. Mm-hmm. And they know they have somebody special who doesn't wear it on his sleeve. One of the things that Chip Lindsay, or excuse me, uh, Clyde Christensen said the other day that really resonated with me was about how humble Drake is. Yeah. And, and how real it is and how he's humble but can be a leader at the same time. It's the humble nature that he has that allows him to be an effective leader because guys want to be around him and to follow him. They're not turned off by him. Mm -hmm. Leadership isn't just getting in someone's face and motivating them to do something because that's only going to work so often. Mm -hmm. With the way Drake goes about it is leadership is just this undying belief and trust in what he does and what he says and just his presence there makes everyone believe a little bit more Mm. and you could see it in the spirit and we'll see it obviously play out in the fall more than likely, as long as they they're competent on both sides of the ball, Uh, they're going to have a chance to win every game they play because they've got him and because he makes everybody else believe. And I do want to get into some of the other guys very quickly. I don't know what, what you're going to hit on next, but uh, I did want to hit for a moment on Huzzy and Gaynor and some of those other guys. Yeah. I want to switch. I want to switch to, um, I want to switch to the defense right now. Okay. and talk about him and Gainer's where I wanted to start. Cause I, he was one of the first guys I got to see up close and personal when they were um, doing some of the Jack drills early on. I will say about that position group, it is thin, you know, it's Gainer, it's Rucker and it was Gabe Stevens. Only three guys working out there. Obviously Malachi Hamrick suffered a injury, a lower body injury and he's out for what's the appears to be the season. So it is a, a thin group, but when you got a guy like came Rucker who made plays during the scrimmage, once again, I mean, I can't speak highly enough of Kmon Rucker. It just seems like he makes plays every time he plays football. And that's exactly what you want from a guy who's your rush in, essentially. It's exactly the kind of guy you want to have down there. But Amari Gaynor, man, first first of all, big fan of the neck roll. He has the old, he wears the old school football neck roll, which you don't see very often anymore. So it's that old a, linebacker neck roll. Yeah, it, it's not the old school when they back in my day it was out. the wrap around like this, yeah. right? Yeah. His is the one mm-hmm. uh Daryl Talley, I think, made that popular when he was at West Virginia and they went in the NFL mm-hmm. and played with the Giants or somebody. But yeah, man, you and I were talking before we hit the record button, but every time that they take the field for the one final time, when the whole team runs out of the tunnel, whether yeah. it's on the road or at home, he needs to be the first guy yeah. that everybody sees. Yeah, because that is like dude central right there. If I if I'm Carolina, I'm not even having four captains this year. I'm just walking him out, just so like him out there, just, Clone just him. that. Put four of him out there. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. That in in physical physically is just massive. He's not, but he's not massive in a way of like, oh, I bet he's not very mobile. He he's big, athletic but he's massive. also really quick, and he he athletic he's massive, he's just yeah. an athlete. He, he just looks like an athlete. There's no doubt about it, and he's physically just a specimen i think he's gonna be really really good at that position he i thought noah taylor looked really good there last year but and he had thought he performed really well too before he got injured but in terms of like physical specimen a guy that i think even has a lot i think has more potential than he does i think armani gainer's that guy because he he really really again we didn't see a ton of today because it's just small sided scrimmage so we'll have to see how the season goes but a guy that's played as much football as he has at, at Florida State coming in here, looks the size, looked, you know, flies around the field um, and kind of a, a no nonsense guy from being down there. Maybe he's still kind of trying to get acclimated to the no team nonsense. a little bit, but very, very no nonsense. So we'll start with Armani Gainer because he was he was he might maybe just because of how big he was probably the biggest guy who stood out on the defensive side of the ball. But there's a few more we'll talk about as well. Yeah. He is all business because he told me at the end of January when when the transfers were made available, it's actually the last day of January maybe, that the, the reason he's in North Carolina is to get to the NFL. Mm-hmm. Like, he, he, Imagine the map. Here's Tallahassee. You 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 know when you have to step on stones to cross a lake, yeah. cross a creek? Mm-hmm. Okay, one stone is Tallahassee. It's one side. There's a stone in the middle called Chapel Hill. 
And then he gets over that to the other side of the Creek and that's the NFL. Mm. This is where he is right now, that middle stone. And the objective is to use this middle stone to get to the other side, which is the NFL. And part of it, a big part of the allure was the Jack position because there are a lot of specialists in the NFL that get paid really well and can stick around and rushing the passer is an absolute desire for all NFL teams and getting guys like that. So he wanted to go to Carolina, learn how to play the Jack position, get better at coverage, get better at isolation coverage, especially with some of those wheel routes, but also, also get after the quarterback, yeah. display that athletic ability. Um, just, show the whole football universe that he can be uh, as prolific as he was at times at Florida state in a different system, playing a different position. Cause ultimately guys like him make the NFL, not because they have a specific position, but they check the box called football player. And like came and Rucker playing Jack now is checking that box. And everyone knows he could be a beast rushing on the edge uh, going after a quarterback and making plays. So he's enhancing his NFL potential by actually checking uh, uh, the biggest box called football player and gainers doing that. And I'll, I'll say this very quickly. I watched him a lot because he's learning the position. Now he had never, they didn't have a Jack or anything like a Jack in Florida state's defense. So when he would do some reps and he come off, he would follow Chiswick wherever Chiswick went and one time he came off, Gene talked to him at least for a minute straight. He's not getting on him. He's just explaining, explaining. He's teaching. So then Gene walked off or something. He turns around to, to uh, Amari and said, come on, come on, come on. So Amari just followed him around. Mm -hmm. And after a guy would take a rep, Gene would turn around and say, talk about that rep, whether it was something that was positive or something he needed to learn that was maybe not so positive. But it was it was like this big cramming uh, session uh, like with a tutor or something like that, that, mm -hmm. that he was getting with Chiswick. And I thought that was really impressive. And for the next 25 minutes, when I went and looked at other stuff and I went back to find Gaynor, well, I could find Chiswick as well. Cause they were always right next to each other. Yeah. I thought yeah. that was really cool. I thought it was. Yeah. I, I noticed that as well. I thought, I think that's like you said, that's why he came here. He wants to learn. He wants to get better. And he he's going to be the guy down there. Him and Rucker are the two guys down there. No doubt, doubt about it. And, and they're I think they're going to be very important to how good this defense can be. And I think Gene Chiswick knows that. Not to mention it's a group he coaches as well. Um, <laughs> let's talk about Elijah Huzzy. And we can talk about that kind of DB safety room at the same time because – it's a it's a sneakily, especially at safety, it's a pretty deep room, especially with like guy like Jaquarius Conley being back there. Geo Biggers isn't even really participating in um in spring practice right now. You got Don Chapman who who's still out there. Will Hardy's not playing right now. I mean, there's 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 a lot of choices at that safety position. So I think they're good there, but focusing on Huzzy, that cornerback room is gonna be very important because it, it's it's a young cornerback room. There's some experience kind of sprinkled in there in a way, but in a lot of ways, it's it's a it's a cornerback room for the last few years that has struggled, and the two guys that have started there for the last couple of years, for the most part, are no no longer with the program. So it's it's a group that somebody needs to step up. Two guys really need to step up, and if not more, and and, and claim those starting spots, and at least claim a a, a a spot in terms of in the rotation. So it's going to be a big battle to see how that group plays out. But I think they're in good hands with with a guy like Elijah Huzzy AJ. I think he looked the part today. Again, yeah. another guy who was very no nonsense to me being down there on the field. Um, not a lot of laughing and joking, just a lot of getting after it and really trying to. And I'm sure there's a, 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 a for him too, a, 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 when you're coming in like he has, especially coming in from a little bit smaller of a program, there's got to be a little chip on the shoulder to kind of prove yourself in spring ball and oh, say, yeah. you know what, I belong at this level. And I think I saw that a little bit today. And from what I saw today, I, I think he's a guy that could be really good for this for this defense as, as well, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out for him because he he's probably the second or third guy that on the defensive side that impressed me the most. I I asked him about that, proving yourself, and I didn't say specifically Chip, but he said, "Yeah, he's got that. He's driven by that, and that's one of the reasons why." Don't be surprised if Mac in the future gets a lot of guys from lower levels from the F, from the G5 and maybe mm -hmm. some FCS every once in a while. We're finding out in football and basketball that guys come from all over the place they can play. Yeah, Fans should never really worry about what school a kid came from. Uh, in, in Huzzy's case, 
you know, he had an interception in practice on Tuesday and we talked to Mac and the two new analysts, uh, Ted Monkino and Clyde Christensen after practice. And Mac said, look, Elijah has had, pra- had an interception today and he's a guy that can go get the ball. He finds a ball. So whether he, it's at the FCS level or another, any other level that he plays at, he's a guy that can go find the ball. One of the problems that they've had at quarterback for a while is they haven't had guys to go find the ball. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem. You you can mask a lot of so-so coverage if you can go find the damn ball mm-hmm. because nothing matters more than getting, getting a turnover. You get a turnover, it's the best thing a defense can do. So uh, I, I did like him. I agree with you. I thought that he he looked the part. And he's – I'll tell you, a couple of times he got locked in some downfield coverage and he stayed right with him and he's, he's kind of – He's kind of, I wouldn't say stocky. I mean, he's, he's some uh, yeah, thickness to him. I see what him. you're saying. I know what you're saying. There's yeah. some thickness to him. And sometimes if a corner is on the inside or outside, I guess, of a receiver, right? let's say run down the, uh, the left baseline, the left sideline, excuse me. And the corner maybe is on the outside, which might be the where the closer to the, the bench there, the bench area. Sometimes they get out physical in mm-hmm. those runs and they cannot make plays. Huzzy looks like the kind of guy – that's not going to be as out physical there. He's going to be able to maintain it. And if refs let a little push in shoving both ways go, he has a better chance of winning some of those battles and some of the guys they've had in the past because of that, because he's mm-hmm. stronger. And I think there's a little bit more of an edge to him. And I agree with you about the chip. I think it comes from that. Yeah. He wasn't a prima donna. He mm-hmm. wasn't ballyhooed four or five star guy. He wasn't someone Max in a press conference two years ago. He's a pro. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that played at East Tennessee State, and now he's in North Carolina. And this is an incredible opportunity for him that he never would have thought would ha- would have happened, and now it has. And he looks like the kind of guy that we may we may well talk about next November. Someone who is making the most of the opportunity to transfer to another school, like him a lot. As far mm-hmm. as the safeties go, I agree with you about JQ, and I'll tell you what stood out today to me about him: no knee brace. I know, same thing, same thing for me. No yeah. knee brace. First thing I yeah, he looked. But, mm-hmm. And he closed and, and Brandon and I were talking about him for a while too. I guess he's a guy that I, I did. I'm going to look at him every time. because I'm fascinated just with the return and yeah, I want to really, see. He was really good. Mental before we progress. Got he was really good. Yeah, yeah. But you know, he made a couple of plays today on the run mm-hmm. where he came from the other side and got his helmet in front of the running back. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is if a running back is going, let's say this way and he's coming toward me you want to get your helmet on this side of them, not this side of them, okay? Mm-hmm. Because that will impede his his speed, his trajectory more than if you get it behind. A lot of missed tackles are made because the helmet's aside or behind. You mm-hmm. get the helmet front, you have a much better chance of making a tackle and bringing him down. And he gets the helmet front every time. So that knows that there's some instincts that football players have innate instincts that you just can't teach. JQ has, has those instincts that knows for getting the nose in front of the ball, ball carrier. And that to me is going to make that safety room interesting. I know Geo Biggers is a returning starter, but if JQ is healthy and is approaching the kind of potential that he had before, if, if the knee injury ultimately doesn't have an effect on his ability to explode and do all the things he needs to back there. Don't be surprised if JQ ends up starting back there with Will Hardy. And I do think Hardy's going to start. Hardy's really good. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And one other dude I want to mention before, so we don't forget is Tamari Fox. Mm -hmm. It's been a while. Okay. It has been a while. But Tamari Fox is still there and he can play and he's doing real well. And I asked Cayman Rucker, I think it was about it after the, after practice today and Cayman was just screaming all kinds of praise for him. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you should listen to those interviews. Power Eccles talk a lot about Amari Gaynor. Some pretty cool stuff he said. But um, I, I think Tamari Fox is a guy that when people do their preseason predictions in North Carolina, they're not going to think about him being in there at all, about him being mm-hmm. on the team, the effect that he would have. He he was a significant contributor before. He's got a lot of Cayman Rucker in him as far as smarts goes and maybe Physical, maybe maybe playing above what people think the specs should allow him to play, that he goes above their ceiling. And uh, he's also an incredibly strong dude. I believe he's the strongest guy on the team. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's someone that checks the football player box. So he's a guy that's playing – with, with maybe four with two hands on the ground, but he's also a football player. He adds that element to it as well. Like 
Joe football player. So I like that about him. And and by the way, KBJ got a lot of reps today, mm-hmm. looking like maybe he has fully moved on from the injuries, which would be great. So we can see what kind of player he is. And so he can have a more normal experience other than always being a guy that's not getting out there because of injuries. Yeah, no, I agree. In in Conley um, and in Fox, it's almost like, because they haven't played so long, really. So it's like two new recruits, really good recruits too. Not not fresh well, guys who haven't, played a, who haven't played a lick of college football. It's guys who've actually played college football and were good at the college football level too. You know, but you know, Dana Dana was also there. Dana Brandon and I are going to do a couple of roundtable pods. Uh, we're going to do an offense one and a defense one, and I'm not going to give everything away because I don't know really what they're going to say. But I can assure you, Brandon will talk about Conley being such a important physical presence out there that had he played at safety last year, all 14 games, they would have been a better team. I think so too. And I it's not so. throwing shade on geo biggers. He just thinks that much of Conley and, and it's, it's the struggles they had with run stopping last year. Everybody thinks, well, not everybody, a lot of people think stopping the run is strictly an upfront thing. No, it's all of it. And you've definitely got to have safeties that can make run fits and can make the plays. And Conley is just built more for that than Biggers is. Mm -hmm. So I could see him eventually being, and Hardy, I think, will be pretty good at that too, especially as he gets more experience. But they need guys that can hit. They need guys that can stop the run. They need guys that are afraid of, of, of getting dirty in there. And that's Conley. He's another football player. And it was really good to see no brace on there today. But it was, yeah. That was a really, really good sign. Yeah, man. He's had a tough last year, even some more than that, with getting injured a couple of years ago and not half, being able yeah. to play last year at all. Yeah, it's it's he's it's good that he's back for sure. Um, last thing we'll talk about because I know you guys are doing roundtable pods in a couple of days anyway, so y'all go y'all will really go in depth on some more stuff in terms of specifics with the offense and defense. But let's talk coaches just a little bit because there's a lot of new faces out there. Um, and, and I know that's something you were going in today, really trying to pay attention to. I was over on the sidelines um, uh, during the scrimmage with Chip Lindsay and the new O-line coach as well. Really got to see those guys up close and personal. Freddie Kitchens as well, got to see him up close and personal. And they added some personality to the coaching staff in a lot of ways. They got, they got some gritty kind of no-nonsense guys down there, especially with a guy like Freddie Kitchens. He, he, he was, he was kind of funny at times with some of the stuff he was – he was saying to some guys, so not in a bad way, but just he's, he's a character as well. So what did you or what stood out to you from being able to kind of watch the the staff a little bit tighter than at least I was because I was flying over the field trying to do video and photo? Well, because I because of the rain, I went up and sat under the overhang at the 50 yard line. So I wasn't close to the coaches today mm-hmm. as I initially planned on being. So I don't know how much to take away I can have, but I, I will say this. Mac is mic'd up at practice. So wherever he is, he can talk everybody there hears him. And he'll do lots of stuff from saying, you know, hydrate. It's a uh, you know, uh, goal or red zone offense. You're it's first and goal. Half-time, you're at the 12 or fourth quarter. You got three downs to score. You're <laughs> at the 12 yard line, whatever the case may be. He'll compliment a player on making a real good play. He'll tell a player to get up, get running mm-hmm. or that kind of thing. So, but when they were working on special teams, Larry Porter had the mic Mm -hmm. and that really jumped out at me as something that I thought was interesting because even though they brought in someone to help with special teams, it's Larry Porter's unit. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was good for the voice that they heard during that all important period of time came from the guy who is the special teams coach. Uh, It shows again that Max, not a control freak and has to say everything Mm -hmm. B those guys are going to hear Larry Porter on the sideline. Now, he's also the running backs coach, but when he's gathering the special teams unit together and is, and is giving them instruction or whatever it is he's, he says before they go out on the field, they're hearing that voice now. They're hearing some of those things now, and I thought that that was really kind of neat. I don't recall if it was that way before, to be honest with I you. Don't, I, I would think I don't it remember. wasn't because I don't it wouldn't. It I don't think it would have jumped out at me so much mm-hmm. if it was something that they did before. So I really like that. I mm-hmm. love how Mac dele- I love how he delegates. I love how he allows his coaches to coach and then he coaches the coaches. Yeah. And I thought that that was really neat. Now I did watch Clyde Christensen some mm-hmm. guys like Clyde and Ted Monkino, they could be on the field, but they cannot teach the players. And technically they're not allowed to communicate with the players, which is mm-hmm. just insane. They will in a few weeks, but it's just part it's of the NCAA rule. just 
yeah. in the NCAA. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So, but yeah, I didn't do a whole lot with the coaches. I'll do that next time. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no, there were enough things to look at today, but I, I do want to watch Clements. I want to go over there and watch him and some of his drills. Yeah. I, I spent some time with the offensive line two weeks ago, but he wasn't doing the bulk of the teaching at the time. He was more mm-hmm. observing. Mm-hmm. He was, he was new. So he was more observing. And um, I want to get down there and hear him coach. I really enjoyed listening to coach cap when he's mm-hmm. talked to the guys and I enjoyed Searles. I mean, it's kind of hard to hear him sometimes. Mm-hmm. Pick now. I mean, I, you need to I, see I, him I ton, really. Yeah. Spring just, went down last year as well. Yeah, that's true. Um, eh, just meh. Mm-hmm. I mean, Nothing you know, to people pop, say yeah. meh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, it, is that like, am I too old to say meh? No, you can say meh. You can say meh. Yeah, you can say that. It's I a did a tweet the other night about basketball uniforms with having your, your nickname on your front, and mm-hmm. I got a few get off my lawn tweets about that. <laughs> like, wait a second, teams have been doing that? For, then one guy says they do it in baseball. I'm like, they've been doing it in baseball since the turn of this, the previous century. Yeah, so, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's, it, yeah, I know what you mean, man. Um, but yeah, I, I need to avoid to get off my lawn comments. Yeah, yeah it's all good, man. <laughs> I will say about Lindsay too, because like I said, I was down there. I, I don't know how to describe it, but pretty calm down there. Pretty in control, it seemed like. I know, again, I know it's a scrimmage, but he was down there kind of calling the shots. It was a couple of times where I was up close and able to hear him kind of talking in the huddle. And it wasn't bitching, it wasn't yelling, it was delivering a message, motivating the guys a little bit and going out there and doing it. So I was impressed because I was down there on the field for towards the end and was able to see some of the offensive coaches in particular. I was impressed with what I saw. And and I, I do think that we need to see a little bit more of them, obviously to know, but from what I saw today, I, it seems like they're in a, a good shape with that, with who they've hired and who they brought in. I, I, I think they're, I think the coaching staff is, it has the potential to be, max best staff that he's brought in since coming here especially with some of the analysts coming in well remember he told us last august that he thought that was the best staff and yeah and in the end as it turned out that uh, it wasn't always harmonious and and some some guys it was time to move on so uh, I, I think it, it i think on paper when you have a former nfl head coach coach yeah that's ends, what that's exactly it yeah and mm-hmm. when you have two analysts i think the analysts make it Mm-hmm. Now that you can have more analysts and Max definitely doing that, I mean, you can walk through the Keenan Football Center right now and know what they're doing as far as renovation and mm-hmm. see what Max doing by having, you know, the total confidence in himself to bring in some analysts who are then going to critique him and critique everything, every aspect of the program. You, you know, you, you can sort of see where there's another level here yeah. that they're trying to get to. I I think that. I'm not going to sit here and talk up North Carolina football on March 25th or whatever it is, because they got mm-hmm. a long way to go. Long way. I think there are a lot of nice parts of this team. I think the program has a lot of good things happening, but there's so much work that still needs to be done. They're not going to roll into Athens and and beat those guys up. <laughs> and they probably yeah, aren't going to yeah, roll yeah. into Death Valley right now and progress, beat those yeah. guys up. Mm-hmm. But they they have a lot of stuff in front of them that if handled the right way, and then barring the unforeseen with injuries and so on, that they have a chance to, to really have a nice year. Max has said nine wins weren't enough. And there's some pushback on social media. Well, three months ago, you were saying nine wins was great. And it was great at the time. And they moved off from that. The season's over. Yeah, news, they news want, season, yeah. And now nine wins isn't enough. And mm-hmm. I get that. And I think fans should appreciate that 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 attitude, that, that, mm-hmm. that, that mantra that they mm-hmm. they've they have several mantras that standard over over uh feelings which is part of how you get beyond nine wins there's a lot of uh, there's some physicality and something rather for defense i can't remember exactly mm-hmm. what it is they got a lot of slogans they do. and the slogans make a lot of sense and if the slogans become part of the group's dna they have a better chance at actually exceeding the nine wins that they won last year and it would be it would probably be a good thing for Mac in year five when he's had Sam for three years and Drake for two year two years to get a ten win season, eleven win season. I think that would probably be very helpful for him, and uh, would be another sign that the program is heading in the right direction, which I still believe it is. Mm-hmm. You know, they lost their last four. I think a lot was learned, and we saw the result of that with some of the staff stuff and with the with the use of the portal. So. Mm-hmm. 
that's kind of a bow on the not even quite the middle of spring practice, Jacob, but a really good opportunity for observations. Yeah. And I, I'm going to go back very quickly and say the, the thing that most impressed me today that I watched was Amari Gaynor and Gene Chizik mm-hmm. and just the relationship and the teaching there because Gaynor's got everything. He just doesn't know the jack position super well just yet. So watching that take full, take process unfold right there in front of you, that's a pretty cool thing because we're going to see that dude in October. Mm-hmm playing at a very, very high level. We should see him play at a very, very high level, the jack position. And we can go back to March 25th and when he was still a little bit, you know, wet behind the ears and and trying, trying to, to gather it out. his yeah. legs. Yeah, it, it just, He was just sort of new to it, which makes today kind of cool. Yeah, it definitely does. The last thing I'll say, we'll, we'll wrap it up right after. I, it's it's like not mentioned in Drake May on the offensive side. I have to give a shout out to Power Echoes, Cedric Gray. When you talk about two leaders, not only for the whole team, but on that yep. side of the ball, it's them and it's not even close behind them. Those are the leaders. Those are the guys. They command respect. And not only that, but today, I a lot of no-nonsense from them too. It was a couple of times when things kind of broke down on defense a little bit, and they were the guys that kind of you could just tell weren't really gonna it seems like it, the standard may have risen on that defense a little bit this year i know it's early but from what i saw today in terms of those two guys in particular the, they're hard guys to you know they're guys that are great leaders they're really good players too and i think they're going to be integral to how good this defense could be because aj I, I know it's early but again i'm going to keep y'all going to get tired of me saying this between the now and the end of and the start of the season i really genuinely believe Car- carolina is an above average defense away from winning 10 plus games this this season I, I think it was the same thing last year and i think they have a great chance to do that this year but that's Although, my kind of stance gonna, on the team <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna drag down the alley for a second on that one. i do think the defense was probably a little bit better than the offense the last four games of last season yeah but they were no the doubt. defense did improve and their comfort and understanding what gene was trying to get them to do was a big part of there that. was some steps think, in the right direction i yeah. also think there was some addition by subtraction that actually mm-hmm. helped in some of those areas too and then the offense didn't play that great so they kind of lowered their their level uh, i um i'm with you i, I so agree I think with it's that you. simple man. Uh, I, I i do i think people need we need to be cautious about trying to build things up too much for people because again it is spring this mm-hmm. is a program that's got a long way to go but this is a program that's come a long way mm-hmm. so they're sort of at that point right now entering year five not even quite middle of spring practice in year five where okay where's matt going to get this thing Mm-hmm. they're at they're sort of at the fork in the road if yeah. they go left if, if they veer off that way that means they just they've everyone's seen the best of it mm-hmm. which is very very unlikely so if they go this way then maybe they kind of settle into eight nine wins every once in a while 10 depending on the non-conference schedule but it's so hard to get to 11 and 12 or they go this way mm-hmm. and they're able to get to 11 or 12 or uh, every once in a while. I don't know if they'll ever do it consistently, but I think, I think the program is in position where you, if you're standing at that fork, you can see 11 and 12 down the road, mm-hmm. but you can also see six and seven or oh, yeah. a cap at like eight or nine down the road. Yeah, no doubt. And that's why this year is so important because this mm-hmm. year is going to show us, especially with Drake, a quarterback, if you can't get the 10 and 11. Might not be able to quarterback. Yeah. Okay, you got a lot, a lot of, a lot of explaining to do, and mm-hmm. I'm not saying that Mac has a lot of explaining to. Do. I'm just saying in general, anyone who has that expectation has a lot of explaining to. Do. The explaining would be, how did it not happen? Because mm-hmm. they've set that they've Mac has set the man. Nine isn't enough. Yeah, nine isn't. Nine enough. isn't enough. Yeah. Was there a show? That, I'm dating myself. There's a really bad show a long time ago called Eight Is Enough. Just never heard of annoying it. kid in that show. Yeah, it's good <laughs> because. You weren't born, you weren't, as my daughter likes to say, you were born a week before dirt. So, um, <laughs> That's good. so I was a little, that my sister, so I was a little kid. My sister used to watch that crap, but anyway, mm-hmm. nine isn't enough. So that should be the mod. Nine isn't enough. Eight is enough. Eight is enough. Nine isn't enough yeah. for North Carolina. So yeah, I, I agree. Anyway, well, it, again, I, hope really I, I hope I didn't blow Let's anybody's see. heads off with that. Eight is enough crap. <laughs> I'd be go- I'm going to Google it when I get off this because I have no nah, idea what show that is. It was brutal. It was brutal. brutal. <laughs> Bringing back bad brutal. memories for you, AJ. <laughs> Dick Van Patten. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm Googling yeah, it when great. I get off. Trust me. I'm, yeah. I'm, you've got me intrigued now. You're going to uh, we'll lose go respect for me. You're going to lose respect for me for even knowing that that occurred. Well, you said you hated world. it. So is is if, if I do end up going down a rabbit hole with it, and, it, and it do, I do agree that it sucks, then I'll at least know that you were had yeah, good taste it in it. Sucks. And maybe it'll be great. Who knows? <laughs> no, sucks. Now, there are some 70s shows that are great. I'm a Columbo guy. Mm-hmm. I'm a big Before Columbo guy, which yeah. all those episodes mostly were filmed, you know, before I knew who my parents were, but I'm a Columbo guy. But a lot of that, like Kate is enough now. Yeah. Let's let's do this. If you if you've heard of Eight is Enough, we're, we can age our audience right now. How go ahead and like this video. Go ahead and like this video. How did we get here? How did we get here? Well, this we were be... we're close to wrapping it up anyway. It's probably because we have yeah. nothing left to talk about, right? <laughs> this might be the biggest THI podcast derailment of all time. <laughs> it's up. There. We derailed into a pile of Eight is Enough. We were very close to the finish line too. It's a shame that we couldn't make it through. It's like running a it's marathon. It's Mac's fault. It's Mac's fault. Make it. Yeah, no doubt. I blame Mac. I yeah. blame Mac for the nine isn't enough. Yeah, because <laughs> you need a better one. Got that little kid. What was that little kid's name? If you're watching <laughs> this and you know that little kid's name, just tweet it at us. <laughs> we're gonna get tweet some random tweets. <laughs> yeah, just get some random tweets. Just tweet us the kid's name. You're going to forget no about Googling. it. Look Googling at your Twitter count. mentions tonight and be like, what the heck is this? If Brett, I guarantee you when they, if Brett Friedlander listens to this, oh, he'll yeah. know. Cause oh, yeah. he, he could name you all the people in that, in all the characters in that show, Mr. Ed, which was like in 1912 or something. So, well, he retweets that, that 70s uh, Twitter page. Like, like it's nothing, man. He well, that's that a great Twitter yet. page, but he, he, he's, he watches all those old shows. He's worse than me. I do well, like some of the old shows. shows. Cause I like to look at the, cause it's amazing. How someone could be 40 years old. And a show from 1976, and they look like they're 65 today. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, in, like they're 40, but they looked. We no, see you're, you're right. Like 65. You're right. You're right. 100. percent You're right. Dudes were uh, 30, and they look like they were almost 50. No, you're right. I've noticed that from some old shows I've watched too. Because I, I have a few that I, at least years ago, used to watch a little bit. Nothing. I don't know about anything from the 70s, but I'm looking into the show you're talking about afterwards, and and, and uh, definitely like, at least figure out what 70s. it is. Yeah, they're all they, drinking, drugging, running around, <laughs> drinking bad tap water. Yeah, God knows, man. Smoking like I said, before my time, and and maybe I should be glad it was before my time. Even though you, when you look back at it, it looks pretty, looks pretty sweet. At least from a guy like me who was a nineties nineties baby, you know what I mean? It looks looks kind of kind of edgy. Seventies? Well, yeah, the seventies looks kind of looks kind of cool. You know, looks kind of edgy. You know? Um, I, I mean, I was alive for the seventies and. So, so, I mean, I kind of remember some things, but my brother and sister are older. Uh, I tell you what, there were no rules. That's what I'm saying. I hear stories from you and my dad and people yeah, like I that. And I'm like, man, I wouldn't mind going back and hanging out, but I yeah. don't want to wear some of the crap they're wearing. I'm not yeah. growing my hair out. I'm not doing that. Being a teenager during that time seems like it was awesome. Yeah, you know, the high school out. I went to, if you go back and look at yearbooks mm-hmm. in the 70s. Oh, yeah. They have photographs of things that you shouldn't have had photographs of. Things Everybody's that were illegal the and, and, are, and it's now legal in a lot, most, most states. Yeah. I'm not going to bring it up, but shout <laughs> out to the rogue shop, right? Shout out to the rogue shop, right? Shout out to the rogue shop. I don't know how right, we got on this thing. tangent on talking about the 1970s. If but you know, if if you watch State is Enough and you think it was a good show, let us know and we'll nope. we'll unfollow you, we'll nope. block you. Yep. <laughs> If you hated the show, we'll follow you and give you a thumbs up. But if you remember yeah. the name of that kid, tell us. Yeah, tell us on Twitter. Give it, and give I, and it, I promise I won't Google it afterward. And if you find out, don't tell me. No, I won't. I won't. I won't let you know. Because I want to see if someone gets it right and if it rings a bell. And if it rings a bell, will. then shame shame on me. I almost guarantee you someone replies. I can, almost, I can, very, I can pretty confidently say that. I think you're going to get the answer. And I think it'll happen quicker than you think, too. So. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and run to see if we can get that information sooner rather than later instead of spend another hour talking about the 1970s. Um, I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Another episode of a THI podcast, maybe the most derailed THI podcast in the history of, yeah, of Tar Hill Illustrated. Oh, hold on. You see that picture up there? There you uh, go. That man. one with the, with the orange frame? Yep. That's 1987, Eddie Murray on deck. My dad took that photograph of the game, sent it to him. Oh, your dad took to it. Sign, he sent it back, signed. My dad got it mad and gave it to me. So that's my biggest prize possession right now. I there. love that, man. Because my dad that. took the photo. And that's, of course, you know, my guy. So, yeah, I know. If anybody knows AJ, Eddie Murray, yeah, that's his guy. That's his guy for sure. That's that's the wall. That right there is, I can't do it. 
That right there is from Cooperstown, the one that's lower from Cooperstown. That right there is a ticket for when he got his 3,000th hit, and it's a signed photo when he was with the Indians. So you won't I can give you a tour of my it. office right now. Yeah. I mean, if people are sticking around through the eight is enough stuff, I'm sure they want to take a look at my office. Oh, yeah. I mean, let's not forget about the Orioles hats behind you. I mean, if that tells you. Oh, anything. I know. You know what I mean? And all the we'll, credentials. We'll get a, we'll get a tour of the office in another podcast. We'll have to. Babe we'll have Ruth's to... up there. Babe <laughs> Ruth is up there. I love it, man. I love it. If anybody knows AJ, big baseball pitching. guy, big Orioles guy, big Eddie Murray guy too. Babe Ruth pitching. Now I got my laptop all messed up here. <laughs> it's good, man. We're wrapping this up anyway. Again, I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. We appreciate you. If y'all made it here, give yourself a round of applause for making it this deep in the podcast. No, if you made if you made it this far, I mean, really, you, you have to have something better to do than yeah. make it this yeah, far. On, be, be better than so that. Do the eight is enough stuff. Be better than that next time. Appreciate y'all watching. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, and the notification bell. We'll see y'all the next one. Thanks. Thanks.